Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are continuing with our series, True Peace, the Secret of Life. Spirituality is very, very important in Islam. And the spiritual structure that makes up Islam is made up of a number of different components. The significance of our soul is part of that structure that makes up the different components of Islam. The soul is very, very in society today. People don't want to talk about the soul. You'll see programs on television, you'll see documentaries being made, you'll see films being made, you'll see magazines, all about clairvoyancy, about magic, about the supernatural. But they don't use the word soul, they call it a spirit or an energy or a force. But one thing people are very afraid of talking about is a soul in society. And so the significance of our soul is something that is very, very important for us to understand in the Islamic framework of spirituality. Man is more than just an animal. He has a soul. He is a living being, not just what we see here in our physical form, but also the being that is actually who we are. This is just a skeleton. This is just a shell. What actually makes you, you, and me, me is the soul. I remember a number of years ago when I was a youth walking along the beach one day and there was this man and he was standing up and he was talking to some of the people that were standing there, some of the youngsters, the surfers, you know, with their big image with their surfboards and men that was there and I was standing with the crowd and he said to him, why do you look at that woman? And the men were saying, well, she's beautiful. She's standing there half naked lying on the beach. But why would I not look? And he said the following, and I always remember this. He said to this man, to these young men that were there, if she was dead now, and it was just a corpse lying there, and there was nothing else there other than a dead body, would you still look at that woman in the same way? And they all, of course, said, oh, that's gross, that's disgusting, how horrible, yuck. And they do all these normal things that young people would do if you had have said such a thing to them. But it made me think about something that day, because we are not what you see in front of us. We are a soul. We are a living soul, and this is just purely a vessel. Just like they were disgusted by what they saw when that man said that, imagine that the soul was no longer there. And the fact that what he was trying to say is that the soul is what you've been attracted to, not the person. And perhaps there's a certain amount of truth in what he said. But the most important thing is that we understand that the soul is far more important than this physical body that is made up of atoms and, and things that we see it as it is now. The soul of a short intermission between the world that is going to come. We were born, we had a short little intermission here in life, a short little rest, and then we move on to the life that actually counts. This soul is having to be exercised. It has to go through changes before it is able to enter into the next life. If you will think of it like some of you at home, you might have, you know, every year you get those little, what are they called, little worms that you have and you, you put leaves out for them to eat and after a few months they spin a cocoon and they go into the cocoon and they disappear for like two weeks, three weeks. And after three weeks they come out of the cocoon a little moth and then the moths try and find each other. And if we look at those little insects, I can't even remember what they're called, but if we look at those little silkworms, they look nothing like the product that they were at the end. When they were little silkworms and they ate the mulberry leaves, sometimes they spin white cocoons, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're purple, they come out totally different at stage because the main existence is when they were actually a moth, not when they were 
running around on leaves, eating the leaves, and having very little understanding of anything that was going on around them. Look at a dragonfly. A dragonfly spends most of his existence as a little creature that lives under the water. And the dragonfly looks for fish and grabs the fish and it eats them. It's quite a, a scary looking creature. And then it only lives as a dragonfly for a few days, but it flies around beautifully, nothing like it, what it looked like before. And we see that this is very similar to what we are as humans. We're not going to look exactly the same way and behave exactly the same way as we are. This is just a phase that we're going to go through. And then there will be the cocoon stage. And after we come out, the cocoon stage will be different. Be susceptible to the same issues that we have in this life. So this world is simply just a short stopover to the next life. It's like a reconnecting flight. You know, when you make your way to the airport, it's quite a mission to get there. Then you have to wait for two hours in a waiting room, basically nothing. And then you get onto a flight and everything's different again. So this is just a reconnection from one place to the other, from one existence to the other. It's a time for us to have self-examination. The significance of the soul is that the secret to success for our soul is to gain as much knowledge as we can and to have control over our instincts, not to just be like animals. You know, some people say, well, we have been conditioned. It seems to be a new word that's moving around the scientific community and the psychiatry community, I should say, that they say, well, people are conditioned. If people were not conditioned like that, they wouldn't become the way they have become. But the issue is, if we had to take people out of those conditions, as if they are embedded in us. But we are not the same as animals. We have, yes, there's a certain amount of instinct that is there, but we also have superiority in our instinct. We are able to adapt our instinct. We are not purely remaining on instinct. Imagine, if you will, if you watch a group of ants. Maybe you're sitting at home and you see some ants walking around your home. And you look at those ants and you say, how are they able to find the food? I mean, the food is over there, and they make this long trail, and they all seem to follow each other perfectly. And that's because they're leaving a scent behind them. The trail that they're walking, they leave a scent. And all the other ants that come along can pick up that scent. And so they're not following the pathway at all. They're just following a scent. If you want to do an experiment at home, take some perfume or take some itter or anything you want and put it on the trail where those insects were walking, and you'll see that it'll become chaotic. They won't know which direction to go anymore. So they're using purely instinct. When a human being who uses instinct gets to a certain point, he realizes that this is why we know that we are more than just instinct. We're not more than just animalistic instinct. Our soul is connected to understanding that there is something greater we have a desire to search for more knowledge. We have a desire to understand that we need to gratify our souls, not only our physical bodies. There is a need for us to separate from this world every now and then. You'll hear people even saying, I need a break. I need to get away from it all. You know, you've heard people saying that. I need to get away from it all. I don't know where you're going to get away from it all because you're never going to get away from it all. But I understand what they're trying to say. They're acknowledging that they are made up of more than just a body, that they are also a living soul, a soul that needs to be treated, needs to be looked after, needs to be fed, needs to be nourished, like we would nourish and feed and look after our physical bodies. Now, those people who long just to live in this world and want to just look after themselves in this world, they don't worry about the world to come. And they think, well, I don't really care if I have a soul or not. They don't care about their creator. They don't care about the hereafter. They don't care about the soul. They believe that instead of the creator, there's a universe that just mysteriously fell into place perfectly. Instead of the gain, how much they can earn, how many people they can influence, how many friends they can have, how many wives they can go through, how many boyfriends or girlfriends they can have, how many people they can step over to be successful in business instead of worrying about the hereafter. Instead of worrying about the soul, they're more interested in their physical appearances and their bodies. Some people, they will spend six, seven days a week, every single day of the week, 
worrying about what they look like physically, worrying about going to the gym, worrying about having the best clothing. They're more worried about their body than worrying about their soul. And so they go through life thinking that this is all there is. And the effects of serving your fleshly needs only lead you to more confusion. You no longer see the Creator as important. Well, it's time for us to take a break. And when we get back from the break, we will continue, inshallah. All praise to Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back. We're continuing in our series on how to find success in life and how to find true peace. Of understanding that there is a human soul, that the human body has a soul attached to it, that the body is just simply a nothing vessel. It really is nothing. It's the soul that actually is who we are. And we understood and had a look at how we can understand that we need to look past just this fleshly body. And the effects of serving just our fleshly needs are the fact that, like we said, that sometimes we replace the Creator with something else. And we say, well, the majority of people in this world say, well, we don't believe that there is such a thing as Allah, who is the architect and the Creator of everything we see. We don't believe that there is a hereafter. We don't believe that any of us will have to answer to anything. We don't believe that there is a soul. We don't believe that we were created better than animals. We see ourselves exactly the same as animals. This is what we see in society today, many people saying. And so what they do is they say that they want to live in the moment. How many times have you heard people saying, listen, I don't want to know about all that. I want to live and whose heart finds rest in the remembrance of Allah Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. You see in society today, so many people running around backwards and forwards, looking for peace. People pay hundreds of rands to go to spinning classes, hundreds of dollars to go to gym, hundreds of rupees to go to a guru to help them to relax, hundreds of pounds trying to find a way to get rid of the stresses in life. And yet, there's a simple verse in the Quran which tells us, that in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest or do hearts find peace. This is the benchmark for true gratification. The benchmark for disappointment in life is when we say, and it says in the Quran as well, and recite to them the story of him to whom we gave our ayahs, but he threw them away. So shaitan followed him up and he became of those who went astray. Here is the benchmark for those who will be disappointed in this life. Who after they hear the truth, who after they understand and believe in their mind, maybe not in their heart yet, but believe in their mind that there's truth in Islam, that Islam is truth, that the Quran is truth, yet they still reject it. These are the people who have thrown away the truth shining light. They have a radar that says, please take me because I want to be ignorant on purpose. And so he finds those people and they go further astray. May Allah protect us from ever being like that. May Allah guide us to the straight path and protect us from becoming arrogant people who think, even though we have seen the truth, that we know better. May Allah guide us and direct us so that we can never be of those people. And may He protect us from becoming people who go to sleep as believers and wake up non-believers. Inshallah. The benchmark of disappointment in this life can also be seen in this other ayah of the Quran where it says, and surely we have created many of the jinn and mankind. We have seen that they understand not, even though we have explained to them our ways. It is very important that we understand that many people are here, yet they do not see. Many people see, but do not believe. We have been given the honor and the privilege as Muslims to not only hear and understand, to see and understand, to believe and follow through in our lives, but we have been given the privilege of being able to read on a daily basis, pick up his word and to read it. It saddens me to hear that many people have never read the Quran. I ask people, have you read the Quran? And they go, no, they've never read it. And that saddens me that you've been a Muslim your whole life and you've never read it. 
I encourage you to get yourself a copy of the Quran in your own language so that you get an understanding of what it's all about and then to read it in Arabic or to learn Arabic as well. But you need to understand what it is all about. It is your book of life. I have in my pocket here a passport that tells me that I have access to this country that I'm in now. It's a little passport and in it there will be stamps from different places that will give me permission to enter into this country. You have the passport of being able to get knowledge and you have to have that book stamped every time you gain more knowledge it's stamped again. But if you choose not to want to learn and not to understand the Quran, you're going to have an empty passport and you're going to have to answer for that. Understand what it is in your own language. Please read this. It is very, very important for you to understand this. The significance of understanding why we have a soul and the significance of the fact that we need to have devotion in our lives is very, very important for our souls. First of all, if we understand that the significance of our devotion is the purpose of our creation, the reason that we worship God is the purpose of our creation. We were created to worship Allah. We were created to worship God. It is the central message of all the prophets. If we look at all the prophets from the very beginning through to the final messenger, may Allah be pleased with all of them, we see that their message was the same, and that was that we need to worship or be devoted to Allah. And it is the key invitation of the Quran. The Quran calls us to submission, to devotion, to worship the one true God. It is the main reason that we have been put on this planet for. We have been chosen of all the different creations to worship Allah of our own free will. The main condition for going into error in this world is when they refuse to feed their soul. They refuse to feed their spiritual being. This is the main reason, the main condition that we find people in this world going into error. It's not because they're going into error because they're reading too much of the Quran. It's not that they're going into error because they decide to grow a beard. No, they're going into error because they are not feeding their spiritual being, their soul. They purely do outward things. They observe just the way they appear. So they might have the right clothing on, but they've done absolutely nothing else. So they will walk around. You know you've seen them in your community. People who are very particular about the way they dress, very particular about having the right Islamic clothing on, but they have nothing else to their Islamic life than that. They don't learn anything. They don't know the basics. The, one of the scariest things I ever heard, there was a gentleman in my mosque who has a nice Sunnah beard, dresses very similar to me, really well, well dressed and everything. And a man reverted to Islam. And I went to him because I thought, this man must know it all. He's an elderly man. He must know it all. He looks the part. And I said, can you teach this? This man, he said, I don't know how to teach him. I said, no, you don't have to teach him the whole of Islam, just how to pray. And he says, I don't know how to teach him to pray. And that's when I realized that he is just observing the outward appearances of Islam. He is doing up, down, kiss the ground into town, but he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what the movements mean. And this is the condition of the error that people go into. When they only know the outward appearances of the religion, but have no understanding of what really is going on. The observance of spiritual actions, which that appear to be sincere, but are not to be found anywhere in the pages of the Quran or any of the hadiths. These are just things that are come from somewhere else. Somebody just dropped them out of the air and put them on your table and you somehow believe they have something to do with Islam. This is also where people go into error. When you see people tying things onto themselves, lucky charms, lucky bracelets, lucky necklaces, and thinking somehow this is going to protect them, that will never protect you. The policeman who walks through the street with his policeman badge on, he can have as many police badges as he likes, but he knows that when the bullets fly, those badges will not protect him. He has to have the right policeman's uniform will not protect him. If he doesn't have riot gear on or a bulletproof vest on, it is pointless. So you have to be careful that we do not go into spiritual error by believing that somehow 
observing spiritual acts that have nothing to do with Islam will somehow protect you. And this is where we see a lot, unfortunately, the great majority of error that we find in Muslims today has to do with that group of people that are doing these things and encouraging others to do it. The third reason that we find people going into spiritual error in Islam is they start consulting with clairvoyance. There is a woman who lives in my complex in South Africa. I, have a, I live in a complex where there are 12 units, apartment block. And one of the units, there's a woman who I've been trying to tell her about Islam. And every time I talk to her about Islam, she says, but you Muslims do this and you Muslims do that. And eventually I said to her, where do you get your information from? She said, from a Muslim. And she was learning Islam from a woman who was practicing clairvoyancy. You see the disservice this woman was doing to Islam? When I was trying to do dawah to her, this woman was coming up with all the magic that Muslims were supposed to be believing in. And she would come up with all this nonsense that this other Muslim had been telling her. So I was unable to do dawah effectively because I had to spend all my time clearing up all the errors that this woman had been telling her. Not things about whether Muslims are terrorists or not, not things about whether women are equal in Islam or not, but the nonsense of clairvoyancy and magic and mysticism and tricks and all this other rubbish that she had been putting to this poor person's mind. The other way that we can get into spiritual error is if we are in isolation. Islam is not a singularity religion. It is a ummah. We are to work together you are not to go and perform your salah five times a day at home. You need to go to the mosque if you are able to get to the mosque. If you have your transport, you're well enough, and it's close enough, you need to go to the mosque. You cannot gain Islam in isolation. You need to learn from others. You cannot learn it from Facebook. You cannot learn it from YouTube. You cannot learn it online alone. Yes, there are Islamic online universities, not a problem. But you still need to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with proper Muslims. then our spiritual growth, which can be devastating for spiritual error in Islam, is if we allow things that are not allowed. We make haram halal and halal we make haram. We start putting our own spin on things and we start writing our own fatwas and thinking we know what we're talking about. We start lowering the quality of Islam. We start lowering the quality of our Islamic clothing. We start using artificial ways we start becoming fake in the way we talk. We start playing down scholars. We start running down those scholars around us. And this is the worst thing, I think, in society today, is when you hear somebody talking and he runs down another Muslim scholar. Whether he is in error or not, he is quoting the Hadith and the Quran. You cannot destroy his writings as long as he's quoting the Hadith and Quran. You can say, I have this problem with the scholar. But you cannot just throw out everything he said because some of the things he says may be helping people. So your duty is not to publicly criticize. Unfortunately, we've seen this happening too often in society where people attack the person and start you know, making a public show of the person. Individual basis, speak to that person and say, brother, we don't agree with what you're doing here. Can you please correct that next time you do one of your public talks? But this is not what we see. Well, we've run out of time again for this episode, but inshallah, tune in again next week. We will continue learning more about how we as Muslims can be successful and how we can find true peace. So from me, Arib Islam, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wala ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Glory be to Allah, all praise to Allah. There is no God but Allah. Allah is great. All power and might belong to Allah, the Most High, the Great. Subhanallah.